Non-binary friends, welcome to another B Plus podcast. I am your host, Greg Unchained. Today is It Doesn't Matter. It's a bonus episode, Patreon bonus episode. Thanks a lot to our patron, Jules, for requesting this episode. He is, of course, our super producer. We are going to dive right in and start talking about our top five factions of all time. Joining me on this experience, Big Boy. Hey, buddy. How you going? I am good. And Danders. Live in large, live in large. Yeah. So we're not we're not experiencers anymore though we're raiders right? We're that's raiders. that's the I'm joke. Gonna, so I'm going to call myself the womb raider. The mm. womb raider. Wow. Yes. <laughs> it's like a terrible porn pun name like tomb raider but womb raider. Yes. No, yeah. I, I I got it. <laughs> I, know, I just didn't. Jokes are only really funny. Witty. Jokes are only really funny if you can explain them to everyone afterwards. <laughs> it only adds to the humor. Yes, I have heard this. I have heard that that is how humor works. Uh, so yeah, we're going to talk best factions of all time. Now, is anyone's list in- comprised entirely of black shirt cool groups? Uh, mine was initially pretty close. Um, and then I felt bad for not including the actual black shirt cool group. Right. Who are, as they pointed out on the Conco and the, <laughs> Conco and the Fudge podcast with Party Boy Jax, they're the only... Uh, black shirt cool group to actually refer to themselves as a group like you have stables you have factions and like in the names and stuff there's always like, like there's packs and there's you know all sorts of you know packs and clubs and stuff but they're the first ever group which i thought was kind of interesting yeah yeah fair enough hmm. group to me just sounds like boy band though like if yeah. someone's a group they're a boy band which i mean Fun. i you know what i would buy the uh, Conco and Jacks album that they released. <laughs> I imagine it would be pretty good. I feel like Conco would be more of a country singer. I don't know why. Yeah, put his country vocals over like Jax's like dance music. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I feel it. I feel yeah. it. Yeah, that'd be like some some weird Justin Bieber Taylor Swift mix. Sure. Going on. Sure. Yeah. Um <laughs> we should point out there is actually like not to be that guy, um, we did. I was that guy when we did the British one a couple of weeks ago. There is actually a technical difference between a stable and a faction. Do you guys know what the te- technical difference is? I don't. Please explain. No. Stable is something like I guess the most famous stables in the past would be like a Heenan family or a, the first family, where it's like um, someone that's like led by someone like a say. Uh, Heenan, and he had a stable of guys where a faction is more like the Shield or NWO, where they all pack together kind of thing. A stable is more meant to be like a group of guys, but they're not exactly they don't exactly come out together. They don't right, you know. What I mean? So like so, yes, yeah, so a stable. So, is so like, like Paulie's yeah. Dangerous Alliance is a stable, exactly. whereas the Four Horsemen are a faction. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I've I've only got factions then in that case. Yeah, actually, in looking at it, I've only got factions. So we actually haven't got any stables, but yeah. Um, I almost had a stable, but um, they couldn't even make my honorables just, but... Right. Yeah. I guess, yeah, because a stable, that makes sense then, a stable, because that's kind of like, you know, a bunch of horses in a stable. Yeah. Under the management. Yeah, that makes sense. Why? Okay. I, I understand that difference now. Thank you for that, yeah. Big Boy Mikey. Highly educational. Thank you. I'm a, uh, but I, I got really excited about this episode because I actually love Faction of Stables. I know we're just talking off air. Dan is just saying that you're actually not a big fan of it these days. I'm actually a huge fan of it, only because what I'm watching these days is very stable focused, or sorry, very um, faction focused in um, both Japan and Mexico. So um, yeah, so I, I love I love this stuff. But yeah, I'm excited to get through this. Yeah, well, it's a big it's a big focus in Japan, right? And it comes out of the sumo tradition where they would have like training gyms. Yeah, and and they would all and it's kind of I, I like it. I like the the whole faction vibe, but uh, it was kind of hard to put together a list of the best 
the best factions. And like Danders, I, I almost went with entirely black shirt cool groups, like your, you know, black shirt cool group, like Bullet Club, NWO, DX, and these kinds of groups. And then, uh, and you know, all their various knockoffs. And I had to consciously be like, no, 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 that's not all a faction can be. Well, I initially wanted to put um, black shirt cool groups as one entry. Uh, but then I was like, well, the best ones of all time, like I think that we're all going to agree on in some degree, are should probably be talked about each individually. But yeah. they do have all have some pretty similar vibes going on, which is probably like why people like them so much. Yeah. Would we count Would we count the Shield as a black shirt cool group? No. I, I, I reckon I'd go close to counting them as one, to be honest with you. No. Black vest cool group. <laughs> Not <Black> like, <laughs> no. People didn't buy shield shirts. Yeah, they did. If you can find me a screenshot where of 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 a WWE crowd where you have a sea of people wearing the a black shield. To me, black shirt cool groups, they have a signature black shirt DX. They have the they yeah. like original DX, they have the just the black shirt with D Generation X the Logo. With the green. Yeah, yep. yeah. Um, NWO, obviously. Bullet Club. Yep. Like. Even the Elite. The Elite would count too. Yeah, and I think that Black Shirt Cool Groups are also generally a little bit silly. They have a little bit of a silliness to them. The Shield didn't okay. have any sense of humour. I mean, Dan, Dean Ambrose, I guess, towards the latter part after they broke up and then got back together though, so kind of different. The, the second run had they had... Um, uh, quite a popular black shirt kind of in a weird way that uh, when they first reunited um, and they were meant to wrestle the Survivor Series, but Rain. But it's not. Day? It's not on the same but, level. No, not on the same level. No. Like. Well, so do you count Undisputed Era though? Because uh, you don't yeah. see a sea of Undisputed Era shirts, but they do have the iconic shirt. Yeah, they I are. feel yeah. like Undisputed Era, like Black Shirt Cool Group from PWA, are. Uh, playing off the whole black shirt cool group thing. Yeah. I well, that's that what Bullet Club were too, right? Like a parody, like a self-referential parody. True. Yeah. 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 Anyway, we so, should probably talk anyway, about we'll, some shit. We'll get, to, we'll get to the actual list. Number one, I'll start. Number one for me, D-Generation X. Speaking of black shirt cool groups. Uh, yeah, D-Generation X made the number one spot for me. Just, uh, you know, I was, I was a WCW guy at first because it was what we got here. Um, on TNT and stuff, but, uh, you know, through discovering WWF and stuff and, and videotapes and at, at the blockbuster and what have you, D-Generation X was my shit. Like everything they did was just ridiculously hilarious. Every incarnation. Like I, I even liked them when they were the bad guys, like running interference for triple H, like when it was, you know, X-Pac, I never understood the X-Pac heat thing. Like I liked X-Pac. I liked road dog. I liked Billy Gunn. I liked their whole vibe. Uh, and yeah, DX, DX was my jam and they were like the reason that I loved, you know, factions growing up. Yeah. Can, can relate. D generation X is probably like the first, I don't have orders for mine, so I'm just going to talk about him like in the order that you guys talk about him. Um, D generation X were the first one I ever fell in love with. I started watching wrestling in 97, 98. So prime sort of thing but i always hated triple h so i still hated triple h even though i loved dx because i was always team rocky maivia and (laughs) um so even like i didn't i've spoken many times how as a kid i never got the heel face i liked who i liked Um, and most of the time i liked the face guy because it was like um that's how it was booked but it's like if i liked a face guy and then they went heel. I would still like them because I like that. Yeah. Part. So I yeah. never liked Triple H, but I love DX. I particularly love the New Age Outlaws. They were my favorite, favorite part of it. Well, their introduction, right? There was. It's just iconic. Oh, you didn't know. Do no no no. <laughs> you okay. We, we don't need Sorry. to do karaoke, you guys. <laughs> Everyone knows it. Everyone listening to this show knows the intro. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, but when they came out and they did the whole, you know, and I mean, like that, we that gave us Enzo and Cass and all that stuff as well, who we've talked about a few times with, you know, Danders, we were big fans of them because they had the same vibe, right? Yeah. And even to a lesser extent, like the intro for New Day 
is like yeah. the whole yeah. thing. Like I never realized that Road Dog did it live. Like he did the Oh You Didn't Know part live until like he came out for a Royal Rumble once. And it, yeah. it just had the do no no part. And I was like, oh, he does that live. Like Yeah, he's... from Gorilla. He's got the microphone. and Yeah. Yeah. And yeah good to know. <laughs> uh, so, DX, now you mentioned being a big fan of The Rock there. And he was obviously one of their classic foes yep. with DX. I was a big Triple H guy myself. I was like the only person I knew who was a fan of Triple H. But uh, yeah, being a big Rock fan, do you have do you have the corporation at all? No. In your list? No? no. Oh, oh, man. I was so close to having them as an honorable mention because I enjoyed the corporation. Like, even with, with like, uh, a, a Mean Street Posse and all of them, like, on the fringes and the stooges and stuff. But anyway, moving on, uh, what did you have, Mikey, at, at your number one spot? So, actually, uh, shit take, or well, not shit take, um, hot take. I actually didn't have DX in my eight, my five, or my honorable mentions because... I was the enemy of DX. I hated DX when I was a kid. They were everything I hated because mm. I hated Shawn Michaels. Wow. I hated Triple H. I liked um, New Age Outlaws a little bit towards the end there, but my number one is NWO. So, like you said, WCW was bigger in my household than WWE in the uh, in the nineties. I loved everything about WCW for the most part. Um, NWO from uh, Bash of the Beach 96 through to about Halloween Havoc 98, World War 3 98 was probably the best book stable I've ever known. Uh, right, for about 83 weeks there, you'd yeah, say. Yeah, there you go. Right. Yeah, there's the 83. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, great plug there for Eric Bischoff, like he needed it. No, um, no, I've, oh my I've, god, that's why his podcast is called Eighty Three Week. Oh my yeah. god, yeah, because they be, because they yeah, beat WWF in the ratings. Yeah. I know, I never, yeah. I never made that connection. I'm <laughs> and, such a fucking moron. <laughs> you know, like NWO spawned off into so many other either spin-offs or parodies. You've had, you know, you had the Wolf Pack, which I kind of still thought was pretty cool at that time. Um, I love. I loved the Wolfpack, I love blonde, blonde hair, Kevin Nash being the big baby face. Everyone used to pop for him. Uh, Red and Black Sting, you know, all that. Then you got the parodies. You got the BWO in ECW. You got the LWO in WCW, which just, was just a racial way of Bischoff getting all the Mexicans into one group. Um, <laughs> then, you know, like, I'm guessing a stable that we're going to talk about very soon is a spawn of Bull Club. Like, it's... And... Sorry, of NWO um, being Bull Club. Yeah, it's basically a spawn of NWO. It's very similar. You know, yes, they started ruining it with NWO 2000 and then post-Goldberg taser moment when all the red and black and black and white merged and every single member of the WCW roster was NWO at one point. Um, yeah. That started getting messy and I understand the, the end of it. The end of most stables are pretty messy. They don't end well in any company yeah. but um i just i don't know there's that whole start especially when it was the three of them like coming in um i'll never forget that backstage segment that they pulled off where it made it look like they were just attacking the whole roster like through little ray mysterio into the truck and um i don't know i think they ran over. right which they tried to mimic in impact with the whole main event mafia and stuff exactly <laughs> exactly like these are moments. These are moments that have been replicated over and over because of NWO. And we, so we got to talk about like if we're going to talk about greatest factions. I mean, I don't think any of us have the click as a faction here because they weren't really a faction on air, were they? No. Until like until you get into like shoot interview era. But I don't think uh, they're DX, a faction at all. No, well they're not an in ring faction at all, but they're a faction of people. <laughs> you know, That's backstage. Not how it works. That's not how any of this works. No, I, I, if we're going to talk about that, that, we have to talk about the. I never remember who it is, but you know how the the BSK or whatever it is, the Undertakers like backstage. Group? Yeah, the that 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 run like the wrestlers court and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying though is, so my number one was DX. Your number one was NWO. NWO were my number two. I think it's safe to say, Dan, does you have NWO in your list of that doesn't have numbers, but you have NWO in your list as well? Uh, no, because fuck WCW. Um, okay, fair enough. I was well, <laughs> I was the opposite of uh, of Mikey. I never watched WCW, um, mostly because it was like 
the the ex- when I started watching wrestling, I watched the um, clip show thing that was on Sunday nights. It was about six months behind the live. Yeah, superstars. Yeah, and it was on at about yeah. ten o'clock at night. I used to stay up until about until like the latest that I could start a VHS or the earliest, sorry, that I could start a VHS where it would still include it at the end because I was like yeah. eight years old and had a bedtime. Um, so yeah. I'm just, I still have, I still have my VHS of the episode of superstars where the, uh, ministry put Stephanie up on the, the cross thing. <laughs> ah, I, I remember watching that and I remember yeah. the, that it was me, Austin, Anyway, um, we'll get to and that. We'd get up on Sunday morning and we'd fast forward through the tape and we'd watch it. It's, yeah. it's insane how similar our childhoods no. were. Yeah, it was Monday morning. You'd get up on Monday morning. Yeah. And I'd yeah, watch it before yeah. ch- before school and then my mum would yell at me. Anyway. As we um, move. Oh, sorry, you go. I, my, to me, NWO were the enemy. I never really liked Hulk Hogan. I felt like Hulk okay. Hogan was always like, when I started watching wrestling, like the creepy older guy who was like right. hanging out with the cool kids um, <laughs> yeah. to me. And so I know Big Boy Mikey's like blacklisting me because he's a fucking Hogan stan. Um, you cancelled. <laughs> I never really liked the end of it. And then like once they came over to, you know, WWE in 2002, yeah. it was just, it was a shit oh, storm. Man. It was not yeah, well, at, at, at that point. At that point, they were all the old guys trying to be yeah. cool. <laughs> but, but no, but my point was, my point was with, you know, DX and NWO at number one and two on my lists and, you know, DX at, at number, you know, DX in yours and NWO in Mikey's, it's safe to say that Triple H, uh, Sean Waltman, Kevin Nash, Scott Hall are uh, kind of responsible for a lot of the faction love that exists oh, in wrestling fans. Absolutely. A lot of people give guys like, Oh, and Shawn Michaels, yeah. sorry. A lot of guys give people like Vince and Eric and uh, Bruce Pritchard and Vince Russo all the credit for the 90s. Sorry, it's those five guys that did most of the heavy lifting in the 90s. Heavy lifting, I mean, yeah, for other sure. Than, for other sure. Than, you know, obviously guys like, um, I know you I know you weren't a fan of him and that's all That's all good and well um, about Hogan, but Hogan turning heel and being a heel, that is one of the, imagine Cena doing that now or like five years ago. Like, he was the biggest baby face in the fucking world and he turned into this evil villain and he nailed it. Like that's one of his best character works that he ever did. Um, and I've got to say leading into, I'm guessing the next we're going to talk about is Bullet Club. I'm guessing. Um, then leading into that, it's actually a really good segue. NWO is what made me fall in love with Japanese wrestling because NWO actually technically was created in Japan. Eric Bischoff still claims to this day it wasn't stolen from them. It was. <laughs> um, <laughs> everything I've ever read, it was a stolen idea from the Japanese that Great Muda and Chono, Chono had to begin with. But anyway, they turned into NWO Japan. Um, and that's when I was like, hey, like, oh, hang on, where are these NWO guys? I want to go see them. And my dad was able to find like tapes of like New Japan back in the 90s. And then that felt made me fall in love with all Japan. So. That segues into, I'm guessing, the next uh, faction we're talking about, which is very New Japan heavy. So, yeah. well, is, is, are they your number? Are they your number two Bullet oh, Club? Yeah. Absolutely. No. Well, go for it, man. Go for it, because they're not my. They're not my number two is NWO. So hit us with Bullet Club. Yeah, uh, a Bullet Club in yours at all, Dandis? Ah, uh, yes, they are. Okay. I Bullet Club. I don't care what sort of side of Bullet Club it is. I don't care if it's the elite Bullet Club or you know, there's been about five different sort of leadership changes in the last... So you're, so you're counting the elite not as their own stable, but as part of Bullet yeah, Club? Yeah, not like... I'm not, okay, that's fair. Yeah, that's yeah. Fair. It, it's all Bullet Club. It, it's all under Bullet Club. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, for me, it's just one of the coolest stables in memory, recent memory. They are, for me, the DX and NWO of current wrestling in in a promotion that isn't the number one promotion in the world, it's probably the most famous faction outside of, I guess, things like Shield and New Day and that. But I uh, just, what I can would, you say I would go as far as to say they're bigger. They're bigger than. Oh, yeah, I'd say they're yeah. bigger. And they've they've broken they've broken into somewhat mainstream consciousness, especially in America, 
with, you know, the, all the hot topic deals Absolutely. and stuff, which is just unheard of outside WWE, yeah. you know, and like, so Ring of Honor, you know, there are more Bullet Club fans in America than Ring of Honor fans, for oh, sure. Absolutely. absolutely. For sure. And here's, sorry, sorry to cut you off. Here's one thing that's like, to me, shows how big Bullet Club are, is that I've never had a huge interest in New Japan up until my interest in New Japan started when one of the Bullet Club members slid into my DMs. That's when I started being interested <laughs> in New Japan. <laughs> and despite not knowing anyone from New Japan, with the exception of Will Ospreay, because he came to MCW, but when they did the whole announcement, I was like, I don't know who the fuck this is. And then they announced Okada and I was like, is he friends with that Will Ospreay guy who came out? Like, I don't fucking know. Who, but I knew who Bullet Club were, even though I didn't, I didn't know anything about any member of New Japan. Um, but I knew who Bullet Club were. And I think that that is a yeah. testament similar to like people in the nineties, people didn't like wrestling, knew who DX were. They knew who NWO were. They knew who Stone Cold Steve Austin was. Yeah, and like the wolf pack, the two sweet hand gesture and the socket was bigger than wrestling itself, you know. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, Bullet Club's the same. Like I, I, I'm the same. I got into uh, New Japan through like I mean, I'd seen clips slide. and bits Please and pieces. It no, slide. not it wasn't through a DM slide. I wish Finn Balor or something like slid into my DMs. That would be amazing. But no, <laughs> I'd seen clips and stuff of like Balor and and Gallows and whatnot doing their thing. But it was. Yeah, it was uh, AJ Styles' uh, run as the sort of leader of Bullet Club that pulled me into watching New Japan. Like, I'd always seen clips and bits and pieces and stuff, but actually watching it properly because it coincided as well with the launch of NJPW World and stuff, so it was kind of convenient. Yeah, it's just, I mean, look at, you know, I was going to say look at all four of the guys in WWE right now, but let's ignore two of them. Uh, Finn and AJ, um, you know, like, AJ was a star before going to New Japan. We're not going to deny that. Like uh, people want to say that New Japan really made AJ. I disagree. TNA was where AJ made his name. Um, New Japan just gave him that uh, gave him that credibility um, again. But well, it made him it made him a worldwide it him, star. It made him he's not he's not an impact guy exactly. anymore. He's yeah, he's an indie star. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, Finn Balor. You know. A UK indie star who, you know, was doing all the cheesy face things in Japan. And, you know, that first uh, initial four when they first turned on Tanahashi and Taguchi. Um, it's almost, I think it's six years at Don Taku coming up. So I think it's nearly their six year anniversary. They've had, what, close to 25 different members, about four or five different leaders, um, you know, from. Finn, and then the night that Finn left, um, AJ came in and um, he attacked a Carter that night. And the same night, AJ became the new leader. Then Kenny, I think Carl Anderson was technically a leader for a couple of days. And then um, obviously you got the Jay White switch play era. And every time that fans want to say, oh, the Bullet Club are dead, like they're not. They rebuild themselves. Like they're like, you know, and we've also got to have a soft spot the fact that. You know, two of our own Aussies and Gino and Robbie are current Bullet Club members, which is, you know, fucking cool. Um, yeah. You know, the stuff that Tom has done all his life. Like, Tama should be one of the faces of the company, um, but he's selfishly, whether he, whether it's part of him or whether it's New Japan booking, I feel that he selfishly puts himself back into the mid-card to elevate the next guy that comes in. I don't know. You mean selflessly? Oh, selflessly. Well, Unselfishly. <laughs> What I yeah, say. unselfishly. You said selfishly. Uh, like he's so selfish, he's uh, going to put himself back down. No, yeah, no, I get what yeah. you're saying. Uh, but let's let's get away from the black shirt cool groups now. I guess we've we've talked about them for quite a while. We're, we're on 20 minutes already. And let's hit my number three is about as far away from that style of faction as you can get. The Spirit Squad. Oh, that's real. I thought you were just being silly. Oh, okay, yeah, I thought that was a joke too. You guys thought I was joking when I said the spirit. You didn't love the spirit squad? No. no. To me, yeah, and see, it's, I like- it's not even specifically the um, the spirit squad themselves because I think that they got a raw, they got a raw finish. Um, but, but to me, the spirit squad um, represents a time when wrestling was not very enjoyable. WWE specifically was not very enjoyable to watch. Yeah, 
Right. But I mean, Spirit Squad and DX, man, and the, the goo and the slime. Yeah, and all they that put stuff. them in the I FCW don't... box and they send them off. Yeah. Are you trying I... to pull out 2008 WWE developmental? Yeah. It wasn't developmental, though. No. It, was like... yeah, no, it wasn't Spirit Squad more like 2005. I, know. I, was, I, just, so... I was trying to yeah. drop the 2008 thing. Yeah, I know. You're, you're ridiculous. Dead, anyway, <laughs> yeah, yeah, very much so. It's dead. It's gone. Leave it alone. Uh, Spirit Squad, though. For, uh, you guys thought I was joking. I, I think I really do. I like very different things in my wrestling to you guys. I like wacky and wonderful and weird. And we're talking about a group of cheerleaders, right? <laughs> like, a group of cheerleaders. And they passed the title around. Like, it was it was free bird rule to the extreme, What's not to love about that? Wrestling is for everyone, Greg. Wrestling, wrestling is for everyone, it. and look, you so know, it makes spirit- me happy that you enjoyed it because it means I, that someone I just uh, enjoyed it. One of my fondest memories was dressing up as Greggy, the sixth member of the Spirit Squad, complete with the headband, the green <laughs> tracksuit, and everything. <laughs> and I got kicked in the nuts at a WWE live event by a kid in a Rey Mysterio costume, <laughs> and it was glorious. I just. Look, again, leading into this podcast, yes, technically, I mean, because that's what I do. I write, I do a massive list. I had about 50, pod, 50 stables and then I sort of did, <laughs> did, did by elimination and all that. Uh, Spirit Squad wasn't even one of the 50. Um, <laughs> like, like, I, like now you're talking about them, I'm like, you know what, they were fun, but they still probably wouldn't make my 50. Um, they were fun. That's the thing to me. Wrestling is fun. So I, 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 like I the, yeah. it's fun, not a funny story. It's very mean. But at 2006 Supernova, no, 2006, that was fucking 12 years, 13 years ago, 2017 Supernova, um, leading into the House of Hardcore show um, when I was at, like, next door to the Supernova event, all the um, House of Hardcore guys decided to set up booth inside Supernova to make a bit of extra cash through the day, which is a cool concept, which is a cool idea. Um, Young Bucks, of course, even two years ago, uh, had a line going back halfway, like bigger than like some of the actual Supernova stars um, that were there. And poor Kenny and Ke- poor Kenny, I think it was Kenny and Mikey. Are they the ones that still do the independent scene? Is it Kenny and Mikey? Yeah. They had one that whole time that I was there. One person went and got sold. I'm like, oh, that's sad. Was I'm it like, Greg? <laughs> 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 no, I've never I'm met like, them. But I, I would have been for I'm sure. Like, oh, I feel bad for him, like, because you know, you know, it was a fun section, and you know, we got we got Dolph Ziggler out of that, so I guess you know, kind of cool. Um, what do you kind of have <laughs> as your third? I know you don't have really a one to five. What would be your next best one to talk about, Danders? If you had a, um, mine would be the Ministry of Darkness. Okay. Um, again, around nice. that same time as DX. Yeah. Um, the Undertaker in that time was truly terrifying. terrifying. Like me yes, as a as a eight, nine year old girl. Proper scared. Like Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how to yeah. explain it. Like he was proper terrifying. Especially like I think it was at the rumble in either ninety eight or ninety nine, um, when Mabel got eliminated. Oh and then God, the yes. Undertaker like Beats him up backstage and chucks him into a van, and then the next night he comes back and he's viscera. And they did the yeah. same thing with Midian. What was Midian? Was it Godwin Henry, Henry Godwin? Oh, yeah. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. They did the same thing with him. Yeah, um, it was truly terrifying. Um, Those were the two I was going to bring up. To viscera and Midian were terrifying. Yeah, as well. they they actually used to scare me more than Bloody Undertaker did. Like. What- that viscera yeah. rebuild of um, from Mabel to viscera that's kind of scared me more than Bloody Undertaker. I was like, holy shit! But yeah, one I think one of Undertaker's best storylines outside of Biker, Biker Taker. Um, I love Ministry. It was fun times. Yeah, I think yeah. it all came crashing down when they became the corporate corporate Ministry. Yeah, <laughs> let's not talk like, about that. That was like that fucking killed it. Like. They were two of the best stables ever, or two of the best factions ever, and then you put them together, and it's like, why? Why would you do this? Yeah. I don't know if anyone else considers the corporation one of the best factions ever, but look at- I love the corporation! I just don't like anything where Vince McMahon is at the forefront. 
I just I think that that's <laughs> the opposite of what wrestling should be. Anyway, uh, to me, but it was him, Danders. It was him all along. Yeah, I know. I've seen the gifts and and like the actual <laughs> thing. Anyway. Uh, that the whole thing with Stephanie McMahon on the cross and then Steve Austin yeah. saving Stephanie McMahon and then Vince, like there being like the truce between them. And you got some really bizarre, but like proper solid matches out of this. Like I saw a cast versus cast match, uh, which was the rock. This was actually, I think it had become the corporate. This was when it first became the corporate ministry. Uh, yeah, The Rock had like a kayfabe broken arm, so he was wrestling with a cast. And so they put a cast on Triple H's leg and they had to wrestle each other. And right. we also got the ladder match where the briefcase moved. And it's like, who moved? The, we still don't know. 20 years later, who moved the briefcase? <laughs> but yeah, to me, this was, I think that if they had have been around longer, and had the um, like the social impact that DX DX had, they would be my number one. They're probably my favourite. Um, but yeah, they were only they were- so you don't you don't have many goth friends because they totally had a social impact. <laughs> that the Undertaker T the cross with the X thing. That's like part of goth. Yeah, imagery. no, I didn't have a whole lot of goth friends when I was ten years old. Okay, I did. Were so. they like those kids from South Park? Like the three yes, kids? Yes, yeah, 100%. 100%. I smoked my first cigarette when I was eight years old because of those friends. Oh, God, so much is explained. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, so they're my, like, number three, I guess. Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Hey guys, just a reminder, if you want to hear all of these wonderful B Plus podcast episodes completely ad-free, make sure you head over to Patreon or Podbean, where we are the featured podcast this week. You can subscribe for as little as a dollar a month, up to $10 a month, where anything you want to help us with, it really helps out. It's going to help us grow the site. It's going to help us redesign some things. And everything that we get through this and through the advertising as well is all going straight back into the podcast so that we can get Aussie Graps out there for the rest of the world to hear about, for the rest of the world to see, so we can grow this mission of watch global, support local, and build indie wrestling. So if you want to be a part of that and get some really cool rewards like call-in shows, bonus episodes, ad-free like I mentioned, then head over to patreon.com slash the B plus and subscribe today. Hey everyone, just want to take a second to tell you about one of our new sponsors, Outbreak Nutrition. Outbreak Nutrition are creating supplements for survival, sharper minds, quicker reflexes, all the energy you need to take your performance to the next level, whether that be on the field, in the gym, on the gaming field. That's right, they have specifically designed gaming supplements as well to help you focus on those late night sessions. They even sell coffee, you guys, at Outbreak Nutrition. You can get coffee pods, you can get coffee beans, you can get supplements for the bedroom as well if you want to enhance your performance there. These are performance enhancing supplements for every aspect of your life, specifically designed by gamers for gamers to stay fit and healthy in the gym, to stay sharp and focused on the game, and to dominate in all areas of life. So check out OutbreakNutrition.com, and for being a listener of our podcast, they will give you 10% off your order when you enter the code B+. That is B-P-L-U-S at checkout. So make sure if you want to stay on top of your game, if you want to take your performance to the next level, OutbreakNutrition.com, enter the code B+, at checkout. Well, right. so in my original list before I started, before I um, sort of woke up today and I sort of um, I was like, nah, nah, this is, this is wrong. I actually had Corporation in my five because I actually loved the Corporation. Sorry about that. But um, they actually didn't, didn't end up making my uh, honourables by the end of it. But a stable around the same time, actually my next two, number three and four, um, are actually from the same time or just a couple of years, um, a couple of years before. In number three is the Heart Foundation. For me, so right. kind of still a black shirt cool group. They did have the black shirt with the red heart foundation leg on. No, not a black shirt <laughs> no, cool group at no, all. But oh no, they were jackets. They were black jackets. Because the the black shirt cool group is about rebellion. Yeah, um, it's yeah. probably one of my favorite moments in wrestling ever is the Calgary Stampede um, in your house Stampede, whatever it was in Calgary when it was the five on five, um, and the biggest heel group, you know, this anti-American establishment 
of five of the coolest fucking dudes. You know, there's only one literally left alive. Um, all four of them are resting peace now. But um, going into Canada and like the cheers and the oh man, like that was one of the coolest scenes ever. Like Stone Cold was booed out of the building in Calgary. Um, the Road Warriors, Goldust and Ken Shamrock, I think it was. They were just literally boo the fuck out of that building. And, like, they were some of the biggest stars. And just Calgary having um, Heart Foundation's back in that was cool. Um, you know, and then, the, you know, when they won that match and all the kids came in and some of those kids ended up being Natty Tyson and Teddy Hart. Um, you know, Brian Pillman Jr. would have been in that scene at the time. You know, so it, it's pretty cool. Um, you know, I was a Bret Hart fan from a kid. We talked about this with... Um, and a British Bulldog. Um, you know, he was in my top five British guys when we did that list. Just such a cool idea for a stable, just the whole whole family in the stable, um, including Brian Pillman, who trained in the uh, in the hard dungeon. Uh, was, and he's got a gun. And he's got a gun. Brian Pillman's but that got was a so gun. Cool. Um, he also has a son. Cool. And, you know, and a couple of the spawn-offs, a couple of spawn-offs that have happened over the years in – um, the Hart Dynasty in um, WWE with Natty Tyson and uh, Davey Boy, and then now the Hart Foundation 2.0 or Hart Dynasty 2.0 in Major League with Pillman Jr., Davey Boy, and Teddy. Yes, yeah, so you got to include all of the incarnations. Yeah, like, yeah. And the um, Leavers yeah. of Doom. Like, Do they no. count? <laughs> no. um, but yeah, you know, like. I guess, you know, Heart Family, Heart, Heart Foundation, whatever you want to call them. Um, yeah, number three for me. And then what have you got going into number four? Uh, for me, I'm in a completely different era. So I might let you just lead away with okay. you, with your number four. Uh, where are you with number four, Dan? Are you still in the same era as your ministry or are you got going different? My uh, number four, and I felt like I had to put them at number four just for the like how Ty Dillinger comes out at number 10 in the Rumble. I had the Four Nations, um, who I think are the greatest faction um, in Australian wrestling history. Uh, Not the greatest current tag team. Fight me. Don't fight me. Um, But the um, the greatest faction that Australia has ever produced. Probably closest second would be TMDK. I'll probably chuck TMDK in my honorable mentions. Um, but yeah. yeah, the Four Nations. My knowledge of PWA is um, still yeah, limited. it's still quite limited. But even then, the match at the last show that I went to in February, where you had Moretti versus Bonza, was insane. And they all have such banger music. Like ever, they yes. all have <laughs> absolute bangers. Um, so yeah, they get the vibe going. They really do. So Four Nations. I had to resist the urge to put four nations at number four. Cause I'm like four, it's gotta be four nations, right? It's gotta be. No, four nations came in at number Did five for me. Pack as number uh, four? Yeah. <laughs> no, but, uh, but no, I, I agree with you. Like four nations are amazing. And uh, of course, yeah, the modern incarnation with Jessica Troy and uh, you know, Adam Hoffman with the blue nation, Jessica Troy with the purple nation. Uh, but they, they also of course had, you know, the, the forgotten nations at this point, there's, you've got the pink nation, which had Sean Custom and Shazza McKenzie and stuff. Like, it's a who's who of the best of Australian wrestling. Uh, was it, it the Yellow Nation uh, at one point? They have, uh, yeah, they've had Tama Williams. They've had a lot of really, really good people pass Charlie through Evans. the Four Nations. Charlie Evans and, and Jessica Troy were Blue Nation originally. I, when did when did Jessica Troy switch from Blue Nation to Purple Nation? I, I missed uh, that. That was in my movie. Purple Nation phase. does not roll off the tongue. It doesn't. The best six months ago now. Um, they technically started the storyline in Yui Pro, but they just, they're like, yeah, we're going to reveal this new Purple Nation member. Like, who's it going to be? Everyone had all these things, and those just end up being Just Troy, which was fine because it was like, you know, Just Troy is amazing. But they still technically Blue Nation when they do some of their Shimmer stuff when it's her and Charlie. So, um, yeah. But, you know, yeah, I, I agree with you. Which, you know, so it hurts me that I had to leave them off my eight because I went into this with nostalgia and. I, how you you're you're the PWA guy and you don't have Four Nations, but Dan does, who routinely slams PWA. I do not. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. What's better, PWA or MCW? That doesn't mean that I slam PWA. 
False. False. PWA is superior. That's like saying, uh, anyway. that's like saying what's better, like... I don't know. I don't have a, a likeness. Butter or I can't believe it's not I, butter? Yeah. Clearly butter well, is better. No, it's like saying what's better, like brown bread or red apples. Like, you know, <laughs> they're fucking, they're, they're different. And it's okay to like both. And it's okay to like. It's of course just, it is. I love both. You know, Melbourne this. just do things better. Fight. No, no, I will fight you. Uh, I disagree entirely. So, I, but anyway, but how did you not have the nations? I'm very no, disappointed. Look, they they were a part of my honorable mentions, but I don't know. Just I guess with nostalgia and with what I'm watching at the moment, uh, you know, I'm going to leave them as part of my honorables. So just so I don't feel so bad. But everything that you guys have both said about four nations is absolutely correct. Um, and to be and- fair, I feel like Mikey has a greater appreciation of a time in wrestling where factions were bigger and. Um, more like I can't bring myself to put the four horsemen because I never watch them. I don't know anything about them, yeah. but I feel like yeah. if I knew more about them, they'd probably make, probably make it. Like, I feel like Mikey had his like broadness of knowledge um, in terms of a time scale for wrestling is far greater than mine. So. Yeah. See, I, I've, I've been watching wrestling for about the same amount of time as Mikey, but I eschewed a lot of the nostalgia choices. Like I, I did like, I, I'm like Mikey, I have like a list of 50 or so. And I'm like, Oh, should I put Ravens flock in? Probably not. Oh. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, but I, I understand the nostalgia choices, Mikey. What was your number, number four? four? So sticking to where I was before with the Heart Foundation in Nation of Domination. Um, I fucking loved the concept of Nation of Domination. Like, it went from being a kind of a Black Panther, you know, BLM type thing to kind of like a cool kind of, um, a kind of a cool swag group and the rock sort of took over it. Um, just the whole, the whole stable was just really awesome. Again, I fell in love with Farouk when he was in WCW. I thought Farouk was criminally underused in WWE. Uh, that guy yeah. should have been a world champion. Unfortunately, he just had about eight guys on top of, you know, ahead of him that, you know, were either up and coming superstars like The Rock and Stone Cold and Mick Foley or, you know, established stars like Brett, Sean, Undertaker and stuff like that. He just... Right. And let, let's be real without going too into it. But also, unfortunately, he was born with the uh, wrong pigment of yeah. skin uh, no, yeah. as well. <laughs> WWE, WWE didn't think that way. Um, you know, they gave him world titles. Uh, Rain wasn't a huge one, but you know, he had a shot down there. But you know, obviously, and let's, sorry, um, let's um, let's not say he he had an amazing run with Bradshaw as the acolytes, like they were never anyone's yeah. favorite tag team, but whenever they came out, people were like, Oh, shit. yeah, shit's about to go down, yeah, yeah. But for Farouk, though, is an amazing wrestler in his oh, own right and he's an amazing singles guy and 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 like when when you separate them in a brand split you think oh Farouk's gonna get a chance to do something awesome here but instead you get JBL world champ and you're like what is go what okay which I mean to be fair uh JBL actually became kind of one of my favorite uh you know like he built a legacy and I didn't like him but that was yeah. the point yeah. right uh as he was very good at his job much like a bully Ray <laughs> who I who I despise uh, so, but yeah, Farouk, I, I felt like he definitely never got his due in the yeah. Fed. I mean, he turned into a catchphrase guy with Dam, and you know he's a Hall of Famer. Um, oh yeah, and he's made yeah, his, he's money. his money, like, and, <laughs> yeah, and he's... you know that stable created other superstars. In you know, first off, let's talk about Mark Henry, um, you know, world's strongest man who reinvented himself a few times over over his career and is one of my most favorite guys um, to ever listen to in an interview. He's one of the, I don't know, he's one of the coolest guys backstage. He is such a, he's a, he's funny, a funny guy. Dude. He's lovely. Like his Hall of Fame speech. And you know, when he was like sitting there crying and talking about Owen Hart and stuff like that, just, and he's just such a good dude. Um, you, know, you know what else it gave us? It gave us one of the best frog splashes in the industry yeah. ever. But D-Lo, D-Lo Brown, Brown I'm maybe. I'm uh, the real deal now. Um, <laughs> Nation of Domination are one of my uh, they're one of my honourable yeah. mentions uh, you know you got the Godfather yeah. slash Karma uh, I think both iterations were part of no it was only Karma that was part of no it was only Karma uh, only Karma yeah yeah then yeah. obviously then Godfather spawned off that 
uh, which is one of my favorite characters ever. Um, he had multiple different characters, but obviously the biggest part of Nation of Domination is one of the biggest human beings in the fucking world right now who fucking should be 20 president in 2020 or 2024, you know, in 20. <laughs> he will be. I, oh, I reckon he will be. Uh, my Mr. Ball is Dwayne The Rock Johnson, uh, my birthday twin. Love that guy. Which I, I went and watched I went and watched fighting with my family again last night and I must have missed it the first time I saw it but uh, in the post credits they have like uh, like in the credits before the after the movie finishes before the credits roll they have like the you know like at the end of a true story movie they have the update on what happened with all these people like Paige went on to spurn the women's revolution blah 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 and all this stuff and it's like Dwayne Johnson went on to a successful career outside of wrestling no shit yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I like that that like, was funny. It was, yeah. Uh, um. Just just to hone it in a little bit, sorry. Um, there was a couple of problematic things like uh, that I'm only recognizing as an adult with the nation. Um, obviously, the DX um, parody oh, with yeah. some pretty cringy blackface. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> is a big one, but also. The interesting thing was, as you said, the the nation were uh, very much a Black Lives Matter, like obviously pre Black Lives Matter movement, but yeah, the Black Panther style. And then the Rock, the yeah. Rock came in, and he openly says that he's not about that life. He's not about pushing that agenda, which I think was him obviously protecting his career, because um, yeah, it, yeah. Anyway. Um, and I feel like when he kicked Farouk out, that very much – it obviously put The Rock over huge and made, helped make him a huge star, but it really lost the message that was integral to the whole Nation of Domination thing. And I think that's why they broke yeah, up, to well, be honest. The Nation of Domination was – it was modelled after, like, the Black Panthers and the Nation of Islam, yeah. especially. Yes. Right? Like, Yeah. And and it was it was very politically charged, which is something that that wrestling tries to stay away from sometimes. Other than like the cartoony foreigner heel American patriot, that's kind of as political as wrestling gets. And the Nation of Domination was like a real, like that's one of the reasons. Like I I almost put them in my top five was because of what it meant for wrestling. Like to have that political statement, um, which clearly it was like Farouk. I, I feel like Farouk believed yeah. in that. You yeah, know? absolutely. Uh, and, and so it was it, it was kind of a special thing. And, uh, yeah, it definitely deserves to be yeah. talked about. Um, absolutely. Yeah. My my number four, which we, we skipped past because we went to my number five with Dander's number four, which was the Four Nations. My number four was actually uh, Right to Censor. Am I alone you in this one as well? No, you're not alone. Well? You know that they were on my list. Okay. They, I guess by default they're right. my number five. Well, no, I'm not sure if you edited your list or not. I'm not sure. <laughs> so, yeah, I, see, I, I, uh, did, I did think that was changed. a joke with you, and I also thought that was a joke with you, Danders. Um, oh, well, no. Why would we be joking about well, Right to Censor being one of the greatest factions of all fair, time? To be fair, I did like a questions thing on Instagram, and someone asked me my favorite wrestling faction, and I put a picture of Right to Censor, and I put anyone but these fucking guys. Um, so <laughs> I yeah. at least look at your Instagram, you know, stories and, and observe it. And I thought it was a joke anyway. Um, no, right to censor dude, 110%. I am, I am fully behind right to censor. Like, okay. Stevie Richards, one of the most underrated solid hands of all no, he, time. He, he, he right? won a title at WrestleMania. That triple can't threat against say that anyone who didn't win a world title in WWE is underrated. No, Stevie Richards won, he won a world title at WrestleMania against Shawn Michaels and Triple H. What are you talking about? <laughs> I don't know about this. Oh, really? What? Chris Benoit. Oh, right. Replaced... No, that's what, that's what I thought that you were going You always replace Chris Benoit with Stevie Richards because it just makes it easy. <laughs> oh. Right. Okay. I, I'm not aware of this. I've never oh. heard of this rule. Okay. No. Stevie. Stevie Richards, I feel, I feel like he was underrated, though. I feel like, I mean, he had an amazing career, and because uh, I was a big fan of ECW and the stuff he did there uh, yeah. with you know Tommy Dreamer and Raven and it, in in that whole thing, and then of course the BWO, another faction that we could give an honorable mention to, but Danders will have a go at us. Uh, you know, there's, <laughs> we talked about him briefly when we talked about NWO, but like, yeah, Stevie Richards is amazing, and he like. The he I would say he's underrated were it not for right to censor. If right to censor never happened, he'd be a guy who was completely underrated. But because right to censor happened, he has a legacy 
in the WWE, which is important. You want to have a legacy there. And yeah, and the way they turned some characters, uh, the way they, they took Ivory and turned her into what, what she was during that group. And of course, uh, you know, the good father, who can forget the good father? Like that's one of the greatest turns in wrestling yeah, history. Yeah, like the with like father. pushing away the hose and stuff, and it was like save the hose, save the hose. Yeah, yeah, Val Venus sort of similar thing. I feel like they could have done more with that, um, but yeah, he was just like buff bad guy. Now these guys were so hateable. They were. This yeah. is like, and it was they were hateable to the point that even the announcers hated them. Like. Yeah, well, the music, yeah. right? It got the music, just the music, like everything was awful. It was great, yeah. and like the the stuff with Ivory, like because Ivory was already kind of like that. Like she was like, I am far above the women of this division, and I don't need yeah. to parade around in my underwear. I'm. She was already kind of like that, so that was just such a natural, organic fit for her. Um, and yeah. This- and come at me, her run up to losing the title to China at WrestleMania 17, her run with right to censor as the women's champion is one of the best women's championship runs that, of all time. No, that, no. Um, but. Yep. Yep. <laughs> putting it out there. You can say it's one of your favorites. You Ivory. can't say that it's the best. You have nothing to back that up. Yes. Anyway. Well. She wasn't even, she was I mean, barely was, even champion yeah. for that long. I, I, well, it felt like it felt like forever to me. I the, enjoyed it. Okay, I love Ivory. I love right to the censor. match against China um, at No Way Out, the the pre WrestleMania pay per view, where China gets injured and Jerry Lawler goes into the ring, which was something that hadn't been done since Owen Hart died. Uh, really sold that spot. Really built that, and it was a squash match at WrestleMania, um, which was unfortunate, but. Especially yeah. since they gave China like three more matches, one more pay per view, and then cut her, um, was yeah. unfortunate. But that was some legitimate. That was a legitimate feud in women's wrestling, in a time where there was no legitimate feuds in women's wrestling. Which may be why I remember it so fondly, uh, and and they were two of the best like actual female workers of the time yeah. as well, and they could have done so much more with it. To be honest. Yeah, fair call. Fair call. They definitely yeah. would have taken But that. yeah, right to censor. Definitely not a joke there choice, Mikey. <laughs> definitely not a joke so, choice. So I have to admit, that era of WWE is a little bit lost to me. I, I still need to rewatch that era because I actually fell out of, lo- out, fell out of love of wrestling around that time. Uh, I was- right. I was a bit later. I fell out around the <laughs> 2008 kind of period. Because of the developmental side? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Clearly, clearly, ooh, that's ooh, why. Ooh. No, um, yeah, I know. I fell out of love with wrestling. I was still playing wrestling video games, and I remember right to sense of being in the games, and used to always be the team that I like try to beat up the most. Um, but yeah, I, I, I missed that whole sort of era in WWE. I kind of fell out of love when WCW closed and and all that. Like, I don't know, didn't really. Didn't really enjoy wrestling around that time, so that's what kind of I kind of forget about those sort of things. But but re- that's like the period of like WrestleMania X Seven and stuff. Like that's the g- widely considered the greatest WrestleMania yeah. of all time. True. Um, Dan, what's left on yours? You got you still got a fifth option for you? I know. Right to censor was my fifth. Oh well, there you go. No, I wasn't no joking. Ah, well, my number five is going back to Japan, uh, kind of. I am cheating with this, my number five, um, because it is technically two different stables, but one was spawned off the other, so I'm going to call it one. Um, one in Japan, one in Mexico. Lowe's in Gobernables, another black shirt cool group, kind of. Uh, right. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. I can, I, I can agree Born with that. One in Mexico kind of. with uh, La Mascara, Rush, and Andrade. Sorry, La Sombra. Um, those three started it. Uh, and over the years, guys that went over to Mexico um, to learn, you know, to find their grass of um, <coughs> young lions or for excursions, all came back to New Japan. And NATO, you know, created uh, Losing Government uh, Blaze G Japan, which, you know, in, in all fairness, has sort of uh, overpowered the original group. Um, you know, right now, 
two of the original leaders are doing really good things, both in WWE and in Ring of Honor, with Andrade being one of the hottest stars in WWE and, you know, Roosh doing his thing in Ring of Honor. Um, but it's the Japanese side, the LIJ, with Nato um, being one of my favorite guys of all time, Evil, Sonata, Bushi, Hiromu, now Shingo, uh, Jay Lethal was in it for a, for a hot minute. Uh, one of my favorite tables in Japan's history. You know, I could have had Chaos in number five. Um, they are a swear alert, part of my honorables we'll talk about it soon. But yeah, LIJ and sort of LI just in general, sort of take the cake um, because of the two different, um, the two different sides of both Mexico and Japan. LIJ are one of the most over factions oh, in Japan, yeah. for sure. Like, they're super yeah. over with those fans. And uh, But I think we should we're, – we're getting close to the hour mark now. We yeah. should probably uh, talk about our honorable mentions. Uh, let's start with uh, Dan. Uh, honorable mentions. The, Dander, Dander uh, the uh, McMahon-Helmsley era slash McMahon-Helmsley faction. I was still in love with DX at this stage, even though they were kind of not very good. Um and I feel like that sort of heel run was really integral to what I consider to be the best year of wrestling in the year 2000. And yeah. my other one is... That McMahon-Helmsley era is completely underrated. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Like that booking, yeah. um, like the whole Vince and Stephanie, that whole dynamic is such an integral part to essentially WWE's nail in the coffin. Um into um, not there, sorry. WCW's nail in the coffin. Um, yeah, yeah. I get you. And I think that they were a big part of that. That storyline was a big part of that because it was so hot in an era where there was no Steve Austin um, because he was out injured. There was no Undertaker, and I feel like The Rock v Triple H really carried the company during that time. And um, my other one is the Brat Pack because they are the best tag team currently in Australian wrestling along with Avery, who I guess they're not going to be a faction once she jets off. I guess they're just going to be a tag team. But the three of them are pure heat. They're absolute money. And, yeah, I wasn't going to have the Four Nations without having them in there. <laughs> Fair enough. All and right, Mikey. so my three, uh, now Four Nations is a part of that. Um, they were always in and out of my honorable mentions. I just nostalgia got me. Uh, but hearing you guys talk about Four Nations in the actual top five uh, and me being the actual freaking PWA boy, I should have them in my top five. Uh, you you know, should. You really all should. All the boys, especially Mick and Jack, um, you know, have, you know outside, of the, out, outside of the graphs, you know, have always been really good to me and uh, really good to you as well and um, to the B plus and that. So um, now, a lot of love for Four Nations. Um, my other two... Uh, Chaos, um, they were teetering on my top five was between them or LIJ. Um, Chaos, one of the coolest stables in New Japan. Um, so many fucking titles, so many cool stories. Guys like Shinsuke, um, you know, Nakamura, Kata, Ishii, you know, fucking Osprey. You know, Chaos has just had so much history. Um, I just fucking love that stable. And my last one is actually something that a lot of people aren't going to believe I have on my list. It's Fortune in TNA. Uh, yeah. Okay. I don't know what that is. No. Well, there you go. Fortune was a stable with AJ Style. No, I mean TNA. What's that? Oh. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Tits and ass. No. Um, <laughs> no. Um, just, it was just a, such a... It was a knockoff of Four Horsemen in a weird way, obviously because Ric Flair like led the stable. Um, but it was you know Ric Flair, uh, Ric Flair leading it with AJ Styles, Bobby Roode, James Storm, um, Christopher Daniels. Um, those are the those were the main four. But then they started adding a couple of other guys. Like, I think Magnus was in it at one stage, Doug Williams and that. But those four, those core four in AJ, Bobby Daniels, and James Storm. I just loved that because I loved. Um, Bobby Roode and James Storm as a tag team. They were just fucking awesome. And then AJ and Daniels, uh, you know, all four of them, look at where they are now. Like, you know, James Storm. Um, still doing his thing, still killing it um, here in Hunter Valley a couple of weeks ago. Um, but the other three, you know, Christopher Daniels is 
one of the main, the top five or six guys at AEW, AJ Styles and Bobby Roode killing it over on Roode, um, on WWE and Raw. Uh, yeah, just a cool, just a cool team. But, um, the team that I missed out on, which I, um, I forgot to add back in, but I always wanted to choose a team from TNA because that era was really cool. Um, another honorable mention, I'm cheating. Aces and eights. Cool. Cool group. Cool idea. Shit finish. Great. Concept. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I like the idea of aces and eights, but yeah. Uh, so before I do, I'll do my honorable mentions as well, but I, I should probably remember uh, Mr. Mysterious did send his in cause he couldn't make the recording, but he sent his in. So his five, uh, included a lot of ones we've already talked about. DX, the heart foundation, NWO, and uh, the elite with honorable mentions of TMDK and the main event mafia, which Mr. Mysterious, no. come on. No, main that's event fair mafia. because that is around that same era that I'm talking about with Aces and Fortune. Yeah, but, I know. But that was a cool era in TNA. <laughs> and that was actually an era where TNA was like, I know they're never going to beat WWE, but they were the. But, but main event mafia was like, okay, so Dan, is, are you familiar with no. main event mafia? <laughs> we're talking about Sting. Like was Scott Steiner? And, I can't remember. It was all old WCW was, hacks, uh, it was, and then Samoa it was Joe, Nash, Booker, <laughs> Steiner, Sting, Angle, and then they added in a young guy in Samoa Joe at the time. So. One guy, one TNA guy, and the rest of them the idea, were hacks. The idea, like I'm sorry, Main Event Mafia yeah, was the awful. idea of it was to have these five guys who had every title in every company, you know, being a dominant force like i know nash and nash definitely and sting kind of were very close to over the hill at that stage but booker and kurt angle were still you know they were still solid guys at that stage I, yeah but i don't know i'm not a fan of the <laughs> main event mafia and the way the way they they wiped the floor with a lot of the other factions like aces and eights kind of got their own up on them but but yeah, aces and eights, and you know, fortune and stuff like they were second fiddle to main event mafia and because it was Nash and it was Scott Steiner and it was Sting, my, and it's my, like no, my gross. memory is me. What did they call the stable in Fortune and uh, Immortal? Immortal when Hogan and Bischoff came in, Immortal and like Jeff Hardy had that heel turn and all that. Oh, they were crazy. they were crazy. Times. It's awful. It's awful. It's no. awful. My my honorable mentions, like I said, I did have uh, Nation of Domination in there we talked about earlier. Uh, I, I want to give shout out to Chikara for Chikara's factions, which I feel like has, has heavily influenced uh, PWA's factions as well. Um, but Chikara have had some amazing factions, specifically for me, uh, The Colony and yeah. Fist. Uh, Fist. Like So some of the names that have been in Fist, I mean, you've got Icarus and Granakuma who are kind of Chikara. Uh, you know, faithfuls, but you've got Chuck Taylor, uh, Johnny Gargano, and currently you've got Travis Huckabee and Tony Deppen, who are just huge, like on the verge of breaking out indie stars. So, uh, you know, Fist are fantastic. They've definitely got to be in my honorable mentions. And my final honorable mention, Three Count. Mm. Because I don't care what you say, Three Count are amazing. Like they had the, the, the manager, Tank Abbott and stuff. And they were a boy band. Like, we talked about boy bands earlier, how Conco and, and that could be a boy band. Three Count were a wrestling boy band, and much like wrestling cheerleaders, I think that's fucking awesome. Which one was Three Count? So, yeah. Three Count was uh, oh. Shannon Moore, Evan Courageous, and uh, oh, Gregory no, that. I thought I was, I was thinking um, Rosie and what was Umaga used to be called? What were they called in WWE? Three Minute Warning. Three Minute oh, Warning. Three Minute Warning. They were three cool. minute warning. No, they were a tag oh, team. They had, um, Rico. Yeah, Rico. Yeah. yeah. Oh, right, <laughs> Rico. Yes. Oh, I love Rico. We're, we're no. <laughs> Rico's moment on... Where are we're, you, Jeff? We're ending Jeff, this show on three on. count. <laughs> three. <laughs> no. No, no, not three minute warning. Three count. Like, it, I mean, come on. You, yeah. Think about the Shannon Moore and Gregory yeah, Helms. No. Come on, dude. Come on. Come on. But, uh, but yeah, and they were a boy band. They were a wrestling boy band. Like, they came out singing and dancing like the Backstreet Boys. It, uh, it What's not to love? Wrestling isn't wrestling. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that does it for us here. Where can people find you, Big uh, Boy? B plus underscore Big Boy on Twitter. And Danders? At Danderfield on Twitter, at Rachel Danderfield on Instagram. 
I am at Greg Unchained on Twitter, at the Greg Unchained on Instagram. We collectively are the B Plus Wrestle on Twitter because wrestling wouldn't fit the B Plus Wrestling everywhere else. Like, share, subscribe, five star review if you like what we do. And thank you so much for listening.